Welcome to the Travel Pulse Podcast. Here's your host, Mark Murphy. Yes, that's right. I'm back with the Travel Pulse Podcast. And you know what? Man, I was so set to get this out the door Monday, a day early, instead of my average of coming out Wednesday and being a day late. And oh my God, you look at the calendar right now and it is Thursday. So, yeah, you know what? I figured I was ready to go, but events got in the way around lunchtime on Sunday. I had to put this off till today and I'm going to get to those details in a minute. But first up, I'm going to talk about the last mile. That's the last mile. And what that pertains to. Oh, you know what? I'm Mark Murphy and I am your host today on the podcast, the Travel Pulse podcast, as has been the case since we launched the damn thing. So, yeah, you got me again. And I don't really uh, see you getting anybody else anytime soon. That's the benefit of owning your own company because you can appoint yourself whatever job you want and delegate whatever one you don't want. OK, so hopefully no employees are listening to this because they might say, well, that's not really fair. Um, now, life isn't fair. And you're going to learn about that. But anyway, here is what the last mile concept is. The last mile is something used in transportation terms. And, you know, you'll see it in cities or suburbs or other places where people who are traveling, whether they're there on business, they live there, uh, passing through, et cetera, will connect from, let's say, a subway station, a train station to their job, their home, et cetera. And these um, transporters, if you would, remember the uh, Segway? That was going to change transportation. Didn't really work out that way for Segway. But now you see all types of last mile vehicles with a scourge of them uh, in the form of scooters. And you probably have read about that. I know we've covered it um, on Travel Pulse and I know it's been covered extensively, but cities like San Francisco were pushing back hard because these scooters, you can basically pick one up, activate it with, you know, your membership, et cetera, and your payment. And then, boom, you're off and running. And as long as you got a charge, you're good to go. And then you just leave it wherever you end up. And so what's happening is the scooter team goes around and gathers these scooters up, you know, at the end of the day and throughout the day, takes them to charging station, uh, charging stations, and then redistributes them around the city. And people in San Francisco, for instance, are bitching about, you know, them being an eyesore on the sidewalk. My <laughs> thing to the folks in San Francisco would be, uh, you know, it's a bigger eyesore, folks. How about the tent cities, the feces, human feces? Oh, and all the needles and drug paraphernalia literally all over the city. So much so that a medical conference of doctors canceled a convention to San Francisco because they said it was unsafe. Now, that's pretty interesting, considering we spent a lot of time in the last few weeks covering the bullshit story on Mexico and how dangerous it is to go to Mexico. Hmm. Yeah, San Francisco's complaining about scooters, this last mile transportation, while they got people defecating in the street. And folks, there's literally a an app that yeah, it's like it's like the poop poop snap or something. I don't know what the hell they call it, but you can basically snap it and then they'll get a crew out there and get it off the street as quickly as possible or the sidewalk. Yeah, that's that is freaking disgusting. It, it, it is what it is. But unfortunately, um, that's the case. So some people can't see the forest for the trees. My friends in San Francisco, that is you. That is absolutely you. Now, some of the other ones that you might be more familiar with, um, something called a boosted board. You may have seen that advertised. That's a four wheel long board. It's got a lot of flex in the deck and it goes up to about 22 miles an hour and you control it with a hand controller that's Bluetooth enabled. And they came out with one about six months ago that can travel about 15 miles without a charge. So you can you can go a pretty good distance on these things. But anyway, let me get back to what caused the delay in my podcast this week, because I was literally minding my own business. You know, it was Sunday right after 12 noon, you know, right around lunchtime. And there was this guy, you know, on the shoulder of the road cruising on this thing. Turned out it's called a one wheel. 
So it's one of these last mile devices. And instead of it being a skateboard, it's almost like it's not a hoverboard. It's literally a, like a go-kart wheel in the center and a board that cuts through it. And you know, obviously they cut them, <laughs> they anchor it, um, you know, with the shaft, et cetera. But anyway, the wheel spins and, you know, you cruise on it. And the guy was going somewhere between 15 and 20 miles an hour. And bam, all of a sudden he was on the freaking pavement. It was unbelievable, right? So if you, if you want to know what a one wheel is, just go look it up on YouTube. That's probably your best bet. Um, you'll see all kinds of videos on it. It's a pretty cool thing. But, you know, anyway, so this guy totally wiped out and car stopped, you know, everything from his glasses to, to his portable transporter. The, he had a, um, a fender on it. That went flying across the road. <laughs> the one wheel ended up in another spot. The um, his glasses were like 30 feet away. They found one of his earbuds. They couldn't find the other one because he hit the ground so freaking hard. And then next thing you know, you know, it was the EMS guys, the police. And um, I guess it looked so bad. I, 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 I'm not sure why, but they wrote it up as a motorcycle accident. Um, yeah, but I was there for the whole, you know, freaking thing. And at first appearance, it looked like the guy broke the upper part of his femur, you know, you know, right at the high end of his thigh, almost like your hip itself, right where it goes in. And uh, but he was, you know, he was basically seen on the ground. They quickly got him in the ambulance and they um, shipped him off to, uh, to a trauma center. And there's actually a really good one uh, down in South Jersey called Cooper University Hospital. So they they fired him off. Uh, they fired him off there. And, you know, away it went. So that was the last mile. And that's probably the last ride for this one wheel dude. Um, but hey, just a little insight. That one wheel dude. Yeah, that was me. Holy shit. That was me. I broke my fucking ass. I literally broke my fucking ass. Well, not my ass, but my femur. And, um, unbelievable. So I was cruising on my one wheel and I was using it as a way to get home because I had rented a car in New York the day before. Wanted to return the car. My wife was out of town. So instead of, you know, doing an Uber, I just like, I'll just take my one wheel. It goes 18 miles on a charge. No problem. I've ridden in 150 miles. Not a problem. And I'm just cruising along and it did what's called a nosedive. And literally I went simply from just cruising along the shoulder of a road on the edge of my town, about to enter my town. I was going to go by my nephew's house. He's, uh, by the way, that's Sean Murphy. He's the guy that helps pilot Travel Pulse, you know, the website tied to this podcast. And I was going to go hang out with him and his lovely daughter, Sophia. But unfortunately, I was on the ground in some serious freaking pain um, because I literally went from standing and cruising to being on the ground with all that description, all that crap around me um, in a heartbeat. Now, luckily, there were people around. They saw me crash. They came over. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever broken their femur. Uh, yeah, you're not getting up. Um, I learned that pretty quickly because my first thought was, yeah, just get, just get me in a car. If somebody could just get me my house a couple miles away, three miles away at that point. I'd already traveled four miles on the day on the damn thing from the rental car location with no problems through neighborhoods. But here we go. Right. And at insult to injury, here's the joke. The joke is this. I got over throat cancer in 2017. I got took got treatment, got cleared, got my energy back around March or April of this year where I could get back to working like, you know, the madman that I am. And, you know, this is obviously the last thing I needed at this moment in my life. But you know what they call it? You know, they call it life for a reason. You live it. You know, um, I still think I'm 15. Uh, I guess I'm not. Um, my niece told me, Riley, she said, Uncle Mark, you're not 25. And I said, well, actually, Riley, you're off by about 10 years. So I really think I'm about 15. Yeah. So anyway, um, just one more irony is when people have asked me how I'm doing with the cancer, I'm like, I'm doing great, man. You know, I'm in the clear. Hopefully it'll stay that way. I knock on some wood. That's me knocking on wood right there. And then and then we move on. Right. But I always add in, you know, a guy named Murphy who's had a little bit of Murphy's Law at different times in his life says things like, well, you know what? I'm going to be the guy that, you know, Mark Murphy, uh, you know, cancer survivor. He survived throat cancer, um, but was 
you know, impaled by, you know, a bicycle attached to a bus that hit him last week on Main Street in Morristown, New Jersey, or wherever I happened to be at the time. So I thought that was ironic, and I didn't get hit by a bus, thank God, and I didn't get run over, but it is what it is. Um, I know it's a travel uh, podcast, so hey, you know, I, I gave you in insight into the whole last mile thing, right? So um, the one wheel, yeah, I can get you a great deal on the one wheel XR, because I don't think my wife's going to allow me to ride it anymore. But if we keep it quiet, she won't know. Because uh, you know what? Sometimes I'm not in the same place. And that's what happened on Sunday. I rode it because she wasn't around. And hence why I blame her for the injury. So shh, let's keep it quiet. Um, I would like to get back on it. But I want to check it because I think it had a mechanical failure. It did this thing called the nosedive. And that's what sent me to launch it. But anyway, um, Always interesting, little insight into the people that take care of us. Um, I know that um, hospitalizations suck. And one thing we never think about when we travel is you never think about travel insurance. And I'm going to tell you a story. I'll probably get, I'll probably get him on a, a future podcast. Brian Major, uh, just a really crazy story about travel insurance, bought it, and then like a week later had a major, major issue, and it saved the day. And this reminded me again of how important travel insurance is because I was just down in Cancun last week, saw a bunch of great friends down there, came back, did a satellite media tour in New York, all across the country it aired, and then came down from New York on Saturday in the rental car and Sunday bit the dust. And, you know, obviously I have health insurance, thank God. Um, but at the same time, imagine if I had done that somewhere else. Imagine if I was riding a bike and had a you know, got hit by a car in Rome or wherever, and you didn't have coverage that gave you flexibility to get treated the right way. That is a travel tip I'm going to drive home. I'm going to try to do it consistently um, throughout my podcast, at least try to consistently remind people because it's about the last thing you think of. And I just saw a stat that says 27% of people actually, um, you know, take travel insurance because when you're young and healthy, you don't think you need it. But look at me, I'm 55. I mean, some would say, yeah, cancer, you're not really healthy, but I think I'm super healthy. And um, I take really good care of myself. And this freak thing happened. And I'm telling you, I would have needed to have been airlifted out of whatever foreign locale I was in because there's no way in hell I was getting operated in some foreign country. I wanted to be back, you know, with trauma docs who, you know, um, could speak to me in the same language, speak to me in a way um, that would put me at ease and know that I was getting the best possible care and also to give me options. I mean, if, if you're if you're not, then you got to put out that money and people don't realize you have to put that money out for that service at a private hospital, let's say in Mexico. And people complain about that. But you're from a different country. So thank God I would have the ability to write that check for any level of work on an emergency basis that they would need to do. I'm guessing most travelers wouldn't be able to do that for a serious thing like this. And we're talking it's going to run, you know, major surgery, you know, holy crap. You know, you, you can't travel for a bit. You won't be able to fly for a bit after surgery. It's going to cost you ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. By the way, you need to pony up because they're not letting you out of that hospital. They're not even letting you in the door unless you pony up. Otherwise, you can go to the public hospital and God help you there. Just telling you, God help you there if you have to do that. So another tip to think about in addition to the last mile. So um, back, to, back to hospitalization. When I heard they were going to make an incision in my posterior to get to my, um, to get to my uh, damaged femur and screw it and plate it in, because that was the thing. They were going to have to use screws and a plate to reattach it. I thought... Well, there goes my career as a butt model, damn it. So when a team of doctors showed up, and I'd never seen them, um, and this was the day of surgery, the day after being admitted, and I was going to have surgery that afternoon, they come in, and I don't know if I was delirious or whatnot, but I was in a hell of a lot of pain. But I asked them if they were going to have a plastic surgeon standing by, you know, to close me up. And they're like, well, not normally. And I said, well, my, my career, so I'm, I'm, I'm a butt model and, you know, this will, you know, this will be an issue. And they're like, well, I, yeah, I, we could, we could look into that and you know, check on that for you. I'm like, a freaking butt model? I, I'm, I'm joking. 
they, they literally took me serious. So we had some fun with that for the next couple of days when they, they brought the, you know, the students and the, you know, the student doctors around, making them around. You know how they come in? There's like eight of them. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I'm on display. And by the way, speaking of display, how about I'm sitting up in bed in pain with that bloody urinal trying to go, which is really hard to do because you're like in pain. So you're tense. You got to relax. Ah. Somebody knocks on the damn door and I'm like, okay, cool. So my wife is standing at the foot of the bed. My wife is like, the lady says, oh, is it okay if I come in? My wife said, sure, come on in, come on in. I'm like literally hanging out there. Everything's just hanging out. And I go, Jesus Christ, seriously? Yeah, Grace, when I got her name, yeah, Grace, come on in. Just come on into the party. It's like, you know, I, I, I won't say what I'm thinking. But um, yeah, it was it was ironic. And I'm like, hey, honey, anybody else want to invite in? You know, just like make sure make sure I'm standing up with my my, my robe open in the back. You know, your ass is hanging out. Um, you know, make sure make sure you catch me in that position. Maybe trying to get back in the bed with the nurse's help. You know, have them come in and take some pictures. And uh, then you can scare everybody at Halloween. All right. Um, <laughs> crazy, crazy. All right. So sorry about the voice. Uh, that's from them jamming the. Um, the tube down my throat, the anesthesiologist. So I guess I'm going to have this uh, raspy voice for a little bit. I guess it's a good voice for radio and podcasting. Um, yeah, they were, um, you know, they were telling me I'm the worst nightmare because when you get your ro- throat radiated, it closes up your throat. So it makes it harder to intubate you, et cetera, which means if you stop breathing, they're, they're kind of effed in terms of what they can do. So the lady was really nervous. She's like, she's like, you are. My worst nightmare. Literally, this was the anesthesiologist before going in. But, you know, but anyway, so that was um, that was the that was my uh, my week. And that's my excuse for being a little late for you. So uh, my apologies. But I think I earned it. And hopefully you've been listening this long because now we're going to get to some more travel stuff. And again, I did talk last mile transportation and saying, yeah, I talked about some stuff. So I haven't gone, you know. Fully, it's all about me. There's been a little bit of stuff, but hopefully you're enjoying the tale because it's been a uh, it's been an interesting four days to, to, to put it lightly. Or I guess it's we're officially at almost five days, four and a half. So anyway, all right. Now I guess the question is, what um, what's going on in the world of travel right now? Have you guys been paying any attention? Well, I got to tell you, there's been some really crazy stories and. You know, again, I was kind of out of it, and my guys, you know, reporting on Travel Pulse have been running a lot of the stories. And what we look at is we look at the stuff that's out there that's, you know, funny, entertaining, what have you. And that's me with the paper. Yeah, that's me with my notes because I do a lot of this just off the cuff, but I at least need the headline and, you know, you know, some of the facts after I've read it. But then my recall is good. I'm not delirious or Alzheimer's has not yet kicked in. So I can certainly uh, roll with the best, as we say. But um, I got to tell you, uh, there have been some interesting stories this week. So first first up, you know, stealing on planes. And this leads us to another travel tip. So what's happening on planes in some cases is people are stealing. And it can be your seatmate stealing. It could be a flight attendant, what have you. It can be a baggage handler. In a nutshell, there was an incident, you know, on an Emirates plane from Paris to Dubai. And they had money that was taken. Um, a Ryanair passenger, you guys probably saw, we reported on that. A baggage handler was stealing a speaker from a suitcase. You know, there's always something. And that means if you're going to check your bags and have them out of your control, even if they are in the overhead bin, even if they are in your seat, lock them up and lock them up with a TSA lock. And the reason you want a TSA lock is because if they need to get to the bag and what's inside and you don't have a TSA lock, they'll destroy the bag in the process of getting it open to make sure there's nothing dangerous in there. And for that raspy throat, a little sip of water. So in the case of... um, a flight from Thailand to Dubai, that was just uh, just recently, another Emirates crew member uh, has been accused of stealing about $5,000 from three brothers who were sitting in business class. And the good news was they were able to um, notice the money was missing. They were each missing some of it. The, some of the bills were sequential. 
And so they couldn't find him anywhere on the plane, but a fingerprint from the guys, one of the guys' wallets matched the fingerprint of one of the flight attendants who happened to be Egyptian and bam, uh, he got arrested and pled not guilty. So we'll see how that unveils, but that's definitely a, um, you know, a, a, a keen tip. You do not, uh, want to have your stuff that's not locked up because people will go through your things and much less so than the norm, like maybe 1% of the time, but just don't be the guy that gets screwed uh, because of that. Now, in Atlanta, something really uh, strange happened uh, this past week. Um, in customs, they found the head of a roasted pig, weighed two pounds, and um, somebody was bringing it in. And he got flagged at customs like I did. I told you about that. Come back from Cancun a couple weeks ago. I got flagged and I had to do the agriculture thing and made the joke about live chickens. Well, I'm joking. This guy's actually bringing a pig head, a two pound pig head, which is really freaking nuts. But anyway, I'm telling you, man, there's stuff that goes on on planes that, you know, if you knew half of what went on and sometimes we see that, you know, that type of slideshow that we'll do that runs on Travel Pulse and gets syndicated out on MSN. Things like, you know, the 50 things flight attendants don't want you to know, you know, like don't walk around with no socks on because ooh, that, you know, bare feet on a floor in an airline cabin. They'll tell you the stories of the body fluids that are there. Yeah, you don't want to do that. And um, you don't want to bring pig heads, um, especially roasted ones in. So that's that's a little uh, insight into a couple of things that are going on. But there were a few other um, travel tips. You know, I think it's kind of funny. Here's a travel tip. Because I've been on planes with 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 some of you people, and right now I'm not talking to everybody on this podcast, but I'm sure there's there's a couple of you out there. And here's what I'm telling you: take a freaking shower, please take a freaking shower. You may love to bask in your own stank body odor. I don't. None of us do. You stink, and we smell you like literally from two rows away. We smell you. You waft past with your melodious odor just hanging in the cabin as you make your way down to the bathroom. And I'm thinking, how expensive is soap and water, for God's sakes? Can you buy some deodorant? Can you do something? Because people stink. So we would all appreciate it as fellow travelers if you didn't smell like a used sock, you know, that had been used for six straight NBA games without being washed and then sat in a dark closet, you know, and got moldy over the next three weeks and then brought on the plane. Yeah, we'd appreciate you not smelling like that. That would be really fantastic. So do us all a favor. Take a freaking shower shower, because um, it's not a redeeming quality when your body odor takes over the plane. And here's another thing. What about food, man? Travel tip number two or three or whatever I'm on right now. I'm on a few. Um, Stinky foods, please. When you're getting food and you're bringing it on the plane, if it's something that's going to overpower the cabin, do us all a favor. Eat it before you get on. Your breath is going to be bad enough. And you know if we're sitting anywhere near you, we're going to smell it. God forbid you have the burp, you know, from fart hell. I mean, seriously, you know, then, you know, we'll all have to suffer through that. We might have to drop the masks, you know. Put the mask on your face before you put it on your, you know, your, your, your child or your seatmate, et cetera, because, you know, obviously you might die. Um, from some of these folks, you could. They bring the worst food on. You know what's banned in Southeast Asia? A fruit that they freaking love called durian. And I never got over it because it tastes like, God, I mean, it, it's like it smells like a garbage dump in the middle of summer, a rotting corpse. Uh, I mean, there's a, a host of, I mean, I don't hang out with rotting corpses, but I have driven by the Arthur Kill um, when it was in its heyday uh, dump on Staten Island. And if the wind was blowing from the dump, whole, you know what I'm talking about, Staten Islanders. It just stunk. And so that's what durian smells like. And people were bringing it on planes. I got the ability to feed Andy Cohen years ago. I, mean, I, I think it was 2010, like eight years ago. Uh, live on the Today Show, some durian fruit. Go look up that segment. It was pretty funny. He was just like, oh, my God. He also ate some crickets and some other stuff. Cool segment. But, again, don't bring nasty smelling food on. 
And here's a last travel tip. If you're the dude in the middle seat or the gal in the um, aisle seat, you know, and someone's sitting in the window seat, do you know how freaking annoying it is? And by the way, full disclosure, I never sit in a middle or a window if I can avoid it. I am aisle guy, okay? You see me on the street, you're like, yo, aisle guy, what's up? And I'll be like, yeah, man, that's right, aisle guy. Because I can't stand middles, obviously. And I hate, because I'm semi-claustrophobic, I guess, being jammed into that window seat as these seats have gotten smaller and smaller. I can do the window seat if I'm in an emergency exit row. Outside of that, I don't want the window seat. I want nothing to do with it. That I will take that or a middle seat on an exit row for legroom. But with that said, it's called window stealing. It's the guy, the asshat next to you, who decides that they're going to kind of lean over into your space right in front of your face to get a great view out the window as you're trying to get a view out the window. And I see it happen all the time on planes, and I have to laugh because I'm never the guy in that seat. And I have to laugh, and I'm thinking, what is going on in that passenger's head? They must be really, really freaking annoyed at this point. But anyway, um, that those those are some travel tips for this week. Uh, I laced a couple more buying the travel insurance. Mark Murphy case in point face plant. I didn't have a drone following me, and I did not uh, use a GoPro. So guess what? You know you're gonna have to go look at nose dive one wheel crashes. Oh FYI, I got the latest version. It's supposed to be fixed. Uh, I'm really effing pissed about that. Um, they did have it on the earlier, the first version that came out had a tendency to do it. And, uh, you know, if people try to ride it in a mode called delirium, you know, you're you're taking your life in your own hands. But I don't. I realize that I got to get up and go to work. So I was cruising. I have no idea why it just stopped, but it literally just hit the ground. The front hit the ground. And when you look at it, you know what I'm saying? If the front hits the ground, you're going 15 to 20 miles per hour. I was somewhere around 15 to 17. I'm I'm ballparking based on um, my travel time. And um, if so, it just drops. The one wheel stopped and I launched. And because I ride goofy foot, you can look that up, but it's my right foot forward. It meant that I got launched sideways through the air like I was doing breaststroke or something and landed um, literally the full impact on my right hip. Now, after the fact, I've learned that chemotherapy, which I've had, can cause more brittle bones and a few other great things. And then people are saying, you know, you got to get off these things. They're dangerous. I've ridden hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles. It was such a fluke that I can't imagine not doing it. Um, But again, uh, the pain I've been going through and the fact that I'm going to be on crutches for 12 damn weeks uh, for somebody who's as active as me, that has given me a little bit of pause. Um, until I figure out why the damn thing crashed. But hopefully I will get to a resolution on that, look at some of the data associated with it, and be able to ping you back and let you know uh, what, you know, what the machine says, if it can tell me anything. And in the meantime, a shout out to the unbelievable team at Cooper University Trauma Center, Camden, New Jersey. Man, just just an unbelievable team. Everybody from the trauma unit that I initially went into. Um, let's skip uh, uh, the nurse on the first night who is a week away from, she's 67 and a week away from retirement. She was horrific. Um, but then for the next day, the day after and the last day I was there, awesome, awesome. You know, I'll just shout, shout out to Christina, to Donna. Uh, to Tran, you know, a whole host of you. You did such a great job. But I will say, oh, and, and um, um, uh, Tiffany, you were great. Um, Michelle, my PT, fantastic. Uh, just what a great crew. I mean, just a phenomenal crew. So um, on top of their game, you know, I felt like I, you know, I was just so well taken care of. But I will have one caveat. There was a technician on that last day. And we just did not, you know, make that connection because, whew, you yeah, know, she should she should have picked a different career, like torturing small animals or, you know, I don't know, um, I don't know, testing on, you know, illegal testing on humans, something like that, because I think she was better suited for that. 
Although when my wife showed up, I watched this personality shift and I thought, wow, am I that big a dick? Um, <laughs> how did I, how did I get the reaction I got when I'm the guy, you know, in pain and trying to be, you know, as jovial as possible? And she's just yanking my leg and I'm screaming like, holy crap, you can't move it like that. Well, you told me to move it. Well, yeah, I told you to move it like gradually. I need you to do this. And I guess she's not really good at taking instructions. She was just like a beast. So that beast, she will remain unnamed as well as the first one. Thank God the first one on the first night is going out in retirement because they'd fire her freaking ass if not. And the other one, I'm going to make a recommendation that she – um she go on monster.com or some career builder and find another career. And uh, I don't know if there's a sub, uh, if there's a category for torturing animals, she'd be good at it. But anyway, with that, I will see you next week on the podcast. Um, hopefully we'll get back on track until then.